Hey guys, Shunty Phillips here, welcome to my June 27th DVD update. We're talking about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. And like I always say, guys, if you enjoy these updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up. Leave me comments below what you guys saw the titles I checked out in this update. Any future titles you guys would like me to check out for future updates. Now, the first ones I got from Shout Factory, Screen Factory, Line are a double feature with Ghost House and Witchery. Uh, the main one I want to talk about in this one is Ghost House. I've never seen either of these movies before. They're from the company, you know, that produced... Troll 2, and, um, you know, The Hitcher in the Dark, and a number of different ones. I usually like their movies. They're, you kind of, they always have, like, a certain vibe to them. They, you know, they're Italian-produced films, so there's kind of, like, sometimes the writing, you know, is kind of weird, because it was always translated into English from Italian, and certain things they say in the movies are always kind of off. They say, oh, yeah, they're, they call the basement the first floor. Or like, like there's weird expressions that you can tell, and I guess the actors didn't really want to tell them it wasn't the way to say it or something, so they just say it. I don't know, but this, the witchery, though, is, you know, David Hasselhoff, Linda Blair, a bunch of people, they end up stranded on this kind of island resort, and things start happening to them, like ghostly, weird things. It's a fun movie, but the movie that I like the most on this set is Ghost House. Ghost House, though, is all about ham radios, you know. They, I think, believe it's ham radios, and this guy who's like a ham radio enthusiast, and I... I feel like nowadays you never hear about these. Like, I don't know if anyone out there messes with ham radios, or I don't even know what they do on them. I think they're kind of like what truckers use, like when they're on the road, they're going like, kind of like in Joyride, when he's like, we're all rescue down here, it's kind of like that, but this guy like is all into ham radios and messing around with things and computer technology, and ends up hearing this call, this guy going, you know, screaming, going, help, don't kill me, oh no, like, you know, really, really funny acting, and I feel like the screaming, there's like this scream you hear, and I think it's the scream that they use the same sound effect in Troll 2. I, and let me know if you guys agree with me. If you've seen this movie, you think they might have used that same sound effect and used it later in Troll 2. I don't know. It sounds so much like one of the screams in it. But they basically, though, they get to this house. You know, they track the signal of where this ham radio sound came from. They track to this house. There's a group of these friends there. And then bad, ghostly things happen. And it all involves this one girl and this doll. And weird kind of deaths and stuff like that. It's actually pretty good. It's like not like a perfect movie or anything like that. Just a fun movie. Really fun music. Good transfer in both these movies. The next one is Charles Band movie, which I've never seen. And I feel like this movie definitely like inspired like Pacific Rim. And it's called Robot Jocks. And he made a couple of different movies like this, kind of like science fiction kind of movies around this time. Shout Factory put out, you know, some of the other ones in like a four movie pack, I think. This one, though, I, like I said, I've never, I never even heard of this movie. I never knew anything about this movie. And it was actually pretty decent. It's kind of, kind of like I said, it kind of reminds me of, like, Pacific Rim might have copied this a little bit. Like, not, like, copied, but gotten, like, ideas from this because of, like, the way the people control the robots. Also, like, even Power Rangers, like, the way they're inside of the Power Rangers, like, Megazord and stuff like that is almost like that. But it's just kind of, like, in the future. They kind of solve all disputes with land and properties and all kinds of stuff with having people go into these robots and, like, fight to the death and, you know, whoever wins and things like that ends up kind of solving their disputes. And then it's all settled through fighting with robots. And the one guy is basically training for this big fight because it didn't go well in the beginning. He's got another chance. And that's pretty much what what it was. It has on here, though, a bunch of different people. A lot of people I always remember from, like, 80s movies and stuff, like, kind of, kind of, like, small parts in this. But it's not a bad movie. It has on here, though, new commentaries and some interviews as well. But a pretty cool, like, different kind of Charles Van movie. And Stuart Gordon directed that. Uh, the next one is from Shop Factory as well. And this is Alien Outpost, Mankind's Last Stand. This is not as much aliens as more as, like, set during, like, the apocalypse kind of time when aliens and stuff like that have come to Earth and, like, basically kill lots of people. And it's kind of like this outpost of all these people out there kind of, like, guarding the land and things like that. And it's all done found footage style and kind of has, like, a like a vibe almost like a, like a regular kind of war, kind of jarhead kind of movie and, like, interviewing the people, talking to them about things. But then, like, they start so spotting the aliens coming around where they are and it's kind of like them fighting them and then sort of just surviving out, you know, out in this kind of wilderness and this environment and things like that. I thought it was okay, but it, like I said, it's not really as much sci-fi as much as like, more like just like a, almost like a, done like a documentary flying around this group of these people on this outpost. It has like the vibe though, a little bit of like Starship Troopers, that kind of a feel to it. It has on here a commentary track, interviews, and deleted scenes. And the next one... 
The star of this is the kid who is in It Follows, which is a great movie. And this is Dark Summer. Um, this movie, I had a lot of questions, though. Like, I was wondering certain things. It was like, like, I was, I, like I, basically the one thing, though, is the, basically the story, though, is this kid who ended up doing something bad and ends up being put, like, in, you know, where he has a thing on his leg and can't leave his house. And he's sort of stuck in this house by himself because his mother is away on business. So he's in this house by himself, not really supposed to have friends around unless there's a doll around. But, like, I was wondering, like, if he's, like, trapped in this house and can't leave because of that thing on his that ankle bracelet, like, How's he going to get food? And, like, was he going to starve to death? Like, a lot of those things I was wondering. I know not everyone would think of that, but I kept on thinking of that kind of stuff. But he basically, though, did what he did was he ended up stalking this girl and kind of following her online and trying to find out anything he could about her. And the one day, you know, he's supposed to not be online at all in this house. He ends up finding a way because his friends bring over an iPad and he kind of connects the Internet through that and then finds the girl that, you know, he's trying to stalk that he's not supposed to talk to, sees her on Skype, and then she's like, ends up killing herself on Skype in front of him. And after that happens, these like ghostly things start happening to him. He starts seeing things, bad things are happening around his house. And it's kind of him and his friends that come over and try and help him, try and figure out what to do and how to make this stop. And that's essentially what it was. Like the cooler stuff kind of happens at the beginning of the movie. And, like, it doesn't have a whole, like, I kind of like feel like in the beginning you see a lot of stuff. It was okay, though. There was parts of it that I liked. It just, to me, I didn't think it was absolutely perfect. Um, and I was wondering all that stuff about, like, the coming by and stuff and, and you know, how he was supposed to be getting food. Because, kind of, to me, I feel like if he was supposed to be under 18, I feel like they couldn't even leave him in the house like that. I just, I don't know. To me, I just feel like that wouldn't be allowed. But it has on here a commentary with the director and some making of featurettes. But I did like this overall, though. Like I said, though, it just had some things you were kind of questioning and wondering about. The next one from Warner Brothers is the Will Ferrell, Kevin Hart movie. And this is the unrated cut and has the original cut as well of Get Hard. And this is a pretty funny movie with Will Ferrell. And it's also one of the, the R-rated ones. Because like, I always like Kevin Hart more when he's R-rated and doesn't really have to hold back. Same with Will Ferrell when they don't have to kind of sense themselves. They're like more of a PG thing. But this is basically Will Ferrell ends up working this company and basically ends up being the company kind of tries to pinpoint all the stuff that goes wrong with him with stealing money and things like that on Will Ferrell's character. Will Ferrell's like, I didn't do it. And they're all going, yeah, ha huh, huh. So he ends up getting sentenced to all this time in jail, doesn't know what he's going to do. He has 30 days to get himself his affairs in order and figure out what he's going to do. And and also he's, during this time, he's trying to prove that he didn't do it. But the people from his company are all trying to fame him but he ends up you know that Kevin Hart's character works in his building as the guy who cleans cars in the basement and Will Ferrell gets the idea that believes that he's been to jail and you know he's sort of stereotyping him and thinking oh he must have been to jail and pays him money to help him figure out how to survive in jail it's kind of him but Kevin Hart was never in jail doesn't know anything about it trying kind of trying to pretend like he does and trying to help Will Ferrell and figure out what to do and how he's going to survive in jail it's it's actually a pretty funny movie though it has you know, on here, deleted scenes, you know, uh, lino rama gag reel, a whole bunch of different stuff on here. I liked it. It's just a fun, silly movie. Uh, the next one, this one, I, I saw the original one this movie. You know, I'd heard about this one a whole lot. A friend of mine in this, um, you know, who is in Ghost Shark and Haunted High With Me is in this movie. Um, this movie is called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And this is not a remake. This is This actually references the original movie. And the original story, you know, about this, this was a, the original was based on a real story about this guy who's killing these teenagers on Lover's Lane. And this one references the movie and saying how the town is kind of haunted by the past and the movie in the 70s kind of brought it back again, kind of haunted the town even more. But basically what's going on is people around the town are getting killed off by... The, they believe this somebody who's a copycat killer of the guy from the original from like the 30s or 40s. I think it was, I mean, it was the 50s. It was killing the characters. It's it's one the one girl that ends up being, um, you know, basically f followed by this guy and people around him are getting killed. And I actually thought it was actually pretty cool. The the stuff to me that was the best was the death scenes. It had some really pretty cool, like inventive different scenes and some different kind of stuff in it that I have not seen in a slash movie before. Went in some different directions with stuff. So I actually liked that it took some chances and actually was a little different and not like by the books with these kind of movies. And I really liked that, you know, uh, Jake Blumhouse produced this movie and the guy who 
you know, Ryan Murphy, who does American Horror Story, was one of the producers on this movie. But an actually pretty cool throwback slash movie. Not perfect all around, but some really pretty cool sequences. Uh, the next one from Sony is the Blu-ray that just came out of um, Joe Dirt. Really liked this movie when I first saw this. It's cool to see this again. It has on here, you know, the making of part two, which is on, I think, I think going to be on Crackle soon or coming up. Because I do want to see it. I mean, it looks sort of like a silly movie, like a smaller budget than this one. But this one is basically Joe Dirt's character, if you guys haven't seen this movie. As a kid, he ends up being abandoned at the, the um, you know, the Grand Canyon in the movie. is basically him, you know, telling his story on the radio to, um, it was Dennis Miller's character about what happened and how he was abandoned and his quest to try and find his parents and things like that and kind of all the things that happened along the way and there's some pretty funny stuff in this movie. I always liked this movie. I mean, like I said, I've never seen this in theaters really liking this. Not everyone actually loves this movie, but I always thought it did. It has on here features on here, you know, commentary track, outtakes, bloopers, but this is just a fun movie. I actually am looking forward to seeing the the sequel, which I'll probably wait though until it comes to Blu-ray though to see, but it does pretty cool though. It does have the making of part two on here. The next one, this is another one I had never heard of in my life. It's from the Criterion Collection. It's called Valerie and Her Week of Wonders, and this is one of those kind of movies that I kind of can slightly obsess about because it's got so many cool weird visuals. I love movies that have really weird visuals and weird sequences that you really think about, and this had that, and like. There's some really strange stuff. It's about this girl, though, um, who is basically kind of all goes through things in like a dreamlike stake. And to try and actually explain it is a little difficult, but though her father went missing when she was younger, and you know, he believed to have been dead, and she's living with her grandmother. And there's these, you know, these weird characters she starts seeing with these weird like, teeth, and she kind of believes that it's her father. And he's just really strange with these really gross teeth and like everyone like, but then he comes around and starts talking to grandmother and they start figuring out how to, you know, kill people and like get like eternal youth from them and trying, they want to sacrifice Valerie's character. And it's one of, one of these movies with really, it kind of has some kind of like visuals of like the Gene Rowland films a little bit, like some of those kind of sequences and stuff like that. Um, definitely has some controversial aspects of this movie too, but uh, a pretty cool movie, though. Like I said, I really recommend checking this out. It's, it's hard to explain, extremely hard to explain, but it has on here a brand new 4K transfer, some some shorts from the director, and then some interviews with the actress that plays Valerie that was filmed a couple years back. But really, really cool movie. Um, you know, just a, definitely one that I would recommend checking out. Uh, talking about it does not do it justice. Look at the trailer for it. Really, really cool movie. Uh, the next one... It's from Lionsgate, and it's Slow West. And I read some reviews of this, and people were saying, oh, it is slow, because it, you know, it's called Slow West. But when it comes to Western movies, like it's either I really like it or I really dislike it. This one I really liked, and I thought it was actually pretty good next to the, um, the Horseman, you know, the Hilary Swank movie. I really love that movie, Proposition. Um, you know, those are some of the Westerns that I really liked. This one is actually pretty cool. It's about this guy who's going to try and find his girlfriend who's come to, out to the West. Um, I forget where she comes from. She came from um, another country, but she's come to the West, and she's sort of hiding out. And um, Michael Fassbender's character is kind of looking for this woman, this girl, because of something that her father did. So she's kind of using this kid and being his kind of guide to the West to try and get him. And you see other characters sort of following around him because they get wind that he's going to try and find this girl, and they believe that he knows where she is. So it's kind of them along this journey and things like that to try and find her. Um, that's essentially what it is. It is a real downer, though. It's got some real downer sequences in this movie, but some amazing cinematography. Some people complain, though, because it was shot digitally, and they're like, oh, Western should only be shot on film. But I thought the look of this with the digital actually kind of gave it a cool, different look, because like like people have said in the reviews, you know, you're not used to seeing a Western shot digitally, and it kind of gave it an ultra-high def look, like a different look. And I did not mind it. And I really thought this was pretty cool. Michael Fassbender was really good. The kid was good in this. The kid from this was from the Let the Right One In remake. Um, but I would check this out. Like I said, it's not for everybody, but I thought it was pretty good. The next one, uh, this one is a bit of a hipstery kind of movie. And I didn't like it that much at all. It's not bad. I like Charles Grodin's part in this a lot. 
I like sequences of this movie a lot, but as a whole, I did not connect to it very much. And it's um, even though the characters are around my age, that they were, you know, Amanda Seyfried's characters and Adam Driver's characters were, I, I don't know, I just, I don't know, I couldn't really connect with this too much. And it's uh, why we're young. It's not bad or anything. It's not interesting though. They have two different covers underneath of this. You don't always see that. Usually it's the same cover underneath the slip cover. But it's um, basically though, uh, Naomi Watts and Ben Sura's characters are these guys who are like in their 40s, like higher 40s. And they, you know, they're always hanging around their friends, always doing the same stuff, never really getting out, doing anything. And then they meet, you know, Amanda Seyfried and uh, Adam Driver's characters. And then they kind of become friends with them and start kind of doing kind of stuff that they do and going out of their comfort zone. And then their friends around them are kind of looking at them like, why are you doing this? And then Adam Driver's character is kind of using him a bit for certain things. And I don't know, Charles Grodin was great in this movie. I've always been a huge fan of Charles Grodin from Clifford to, you know, Beethoven to, you know, The Lonely Man the years back and to, you know, um, Heartbreak Kid. And he's great in this movie. It had a great sequence in this movie at the end of the movie. I liked it, like I said, but I also couldn't connect to it that much. And it does have that kind of hipstery kind of vibe. But has on here, I don't think there was too many features on this one. But it was it's not terrible. I think a lot of people would like this. Um, but more of a rental kind of vibe one. Uh, the next one, this is one that I was really looking forward to seeing. And it is slow, but it picks up in, in certain parts. And, you know... It, it, it almost could have been a, almost could have been a short just because some stuff doesn't have a whole lot of content and Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of drops out and then comes back at points and but it's you know the movie is Maggie with Abigail Breslin and Arnold Schwarzenegger it's definitely one of the most different movies and different roles for Arnold Schwarzenegger and I actually you know, I thought his performance in this was actually really good I really believed it and thought he was doing a good job same with Abigail Breslin but she's been good in everything the movie though is set during a time where it's people have been affected, you know, basically becoming zombies. But it's not like the crazy type zombies. It's different. It's like a slow progress in zombies where the people who become infected can actually still live with you and they can be with you for for a little while until they basically totally turn and get to a point where you either have to put them in a quarantine or, you know, take them out yourself and kill them. And it's pretty much with our our Schwarzenegger's character taking her uh, Abigail Breslin home living with her while she's getting worse and worse and kind of deteriorating and knowing that the time is going to come when he's going to have to kill her. It, the movie, though, it doesn't have the feel of some movies where you kind of think, oh, is there any hope? But the movie has this real hopeless vibe to it because there, there's never any talk about hope. It's just got this real, and you think there might be, and then, no. I, I liked it, though, but like I said, though, it, it's got some slow parts to it and that don't work that great. But then there's parts that really do work. In the end, I thought it worked pretty good. Um, and I liked it because it was very different from Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I actually would like to see him do this. To me, too, when it comes to Schwarzenegger movies, I've always really loved him in comedies. I, I would love to see him do them again, like Twins and Junior. I loved him in comedies. You know, Kindergarten Cop. But this has a commentary track, Making of a Deleted Scenes. Uh, the next one is a Steven Seagal movie. Um, you know, some lines get as well in this absolution. And this is, you know, you, if you've seen Steven Seagal movies, you kind of know what they are. But this one, it's kind of like he's like a guy who goes around killing people for hire. Like people hire him to get take people out and things like that. And he's saying in the beginning of the movie that he's a bad guy and feels like he's always done terrible things and hopes that one day he can do something to kind of give him absolution for what he's done and he kind of can help somebody or do something good. And it's essentially, though, when he's on this one mission, he ends up, seen this girl who's ended up getting away from Vinnie Jones's character and because Vinnie Jones is a terrible bad villain in this movie he's done bad things and she's kind of coming after this girl he ends up deciding to try and help her and it's kind of him trying to keep her safe while people are coming after him and he has to start killing people so it's that kind of a movie it's okay nothing like amazing or super special though it has on here though a commentary track and interviews but if you like Steven Seagal and Vinnie Jones, Vinnie Jones was pretty cool and played a really bad guy in this movie. Definitely check this out. The next one is 71 with Jack O'Connor, you know, who is from, uh, you know, Unbroken. Very good actor. And this is, you know, tr I believe it's a true story, though. And it's about, you know, when the, the fighting was going on in, in England and Ireland, you know, and it's 
I think that's pretty much what you would say. And, and he goes in there to try and kind of, with his group of these army guys, trying to kind of settle things and kind of keep the peace. But then there's this huge riot. He's there with all the guys, and he ends up getting separated. And it's kind of him trying to get back and then surviving the night while people are coming after him, you know, the people who are, you know, he's there to try and keep things going peaceful where they're coming after him and want to kind of kill him and it's kind of him trying to hide out and figure out where he's going to go figure out who he can trust and things like that very very well acted movie I actually thought this was pretty good uh, you know like as I said too that star is from Unbroken um, and the next one from Arrow US is Contamination which just has an amazing cover on this one absolutely love this cover um, like a cool shiny thing to this and let's just a little look inside the disc art is really cool in this movie. This is a, you know, people call this like, you know, it also has the alternate cover underneath as well, for the alternate poster. But some people say like, oh, this movie's kind of like a knockoff of Alien. And not really. I mean, like the egg kind of aspect is a little bit. But this is kind of about this, this whole boat that has like a whole shipment of all these, it's supposed to be coffee, but it's all these like millions, like hundreds and thousands of eggs. These things that like if they get on heat, they kind of like blow up and put this acid all over you and then the people who get the acid on them they like their insides explode and blow up and it's a very creepy weird aspect like the beginning of the movie was the coolest stuff with these people exploding and, and throughout the movie they have other people exploding to it but it's not really like in space or anything like that but it's about the uh, police officers and this doctor trying to figure it out and try and track the origin of this because they believe these terrorists want to use these things to blow up things and have all these plans and things like that. It's a pretty cool movie. Like, it's another one that I had never seen before. It has on here a brand new transfer on the movie, some new interviews. And one feature on this, this really cool feature, is talking about in all the, like, a, it's, I think it's like 20 minutes talking about the Italian knockoffs, like talking about the Mad Max knockoffs, the alien-type knockoffs, the Jaws ones, and they had a bunch of clips. I would, Hopefully, Arrow puts out some of those other ones, like maybe some of those Jaws ones that they, like the Last Shark and stuff. I know those always have issues, though, because of, I think they use some footage from Jaws, and usually they like to put cease and desist on those movies and stuff. But this is a pretty cool one, like I said, one that I had never seen. The next one is one I always remember. I first saw this because I wanted to see it because Sid Haig was in this. It's one of his first or one of his earliest movies. This is the Jack Hill film, uh, Spider Baby. Oh, it has an alternate title as well. Um, but it's, it's really a pretty cool, weird movie. Uh, here's a little look inside of the thing. You know, the discs. It's a black and white movie. Really cool, though. As I said, too, it has the, the alternate uh, cover as well underneath of it in a booklet about the movie. But the movie's basically, though, about the people, you know, have this kind of thing, this whole line of family that has this kind of condition where they start digressing. As the older they get, they start kind of going back to, like, childlike behaviors and kind of become cannibalistic and crazy, you know, like killing animals and killing things. And, um, you know, it's... Who is the actor in this, you know... You know, Lon Chaney Jr. is basically the caretaker of these kids because their father died, and the state is coming by because they want to put these kids into an orphanage or put them into homes and things like that with one of the other family members. That, and it's kind of like a whole thing about when they come to this house, the things that happen. It has a t it's totally a movie that definitely inspired House of a Thousand Corpses. It has that kind of vibe to it. Even like Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well. That's like a sort of type feel to that. They get to this house these crazy characters. The one girl is like, you know, kills people and she says in her spider web and has these blades, she kills them and, you know, uh, you know, Sid Haig is in this movie, great performance in this movie. Has a new interview on here with the director and Sid Haig talking about the making of this movie. No, was that on this? No, that was on Pit Stop. The Pit Stop had the new interview. This one has a, lot, a brand new transfer on this as well. Bunch of new features on this. Just a really, really cool movie. Uh, the next one is a Takashi McKay movie, you know, who directed uh, Audition, Audition, and this is The Happiness of Katakurus, I think that's how you say that, and, uh, yeah, I think there's nothing inside here I can't show, and here's a little look at the discs, but this movie is a really pretty cool, weird movie that he did, and it's kind of like a bit of like a sound of music, musical kind of movie, mixed with all this different stuff, but it's about a family that works this kind of cottage place type inn, and they're having all kinds of financial problems, and no one's really coming there, and no one's staying there, and they don't know what they're going to do. All of a sudden, people start staying there, and then start dying off, and like dying in here, and 
And then they kind of like sing songs and kind of like plan out like how what they're going to do and what to do with the bodies and stuff like that. Like sing sequences of music on this. These insane sequences of like animated, like stop motion animation, kind of like Pee Wee's Playhouse opening. But like really cool, twisted, weird animation. It's just a really cool, weird movie about what's happening to people coming there. Um, the next one from Arrow. This is another one that I had never seen. And it's, um, you know, Pit Stop. It's another Jack Hill film. And, um, and this is a pretty interesting movie. Um, the movie's basically, though, about this, you know, race car driver who ends up getting, you know, this guy who has this racetrack. It's kind of an interesting one because it has a intersection in the middle of the racetrack. So it's a super dangerous racetrack where they have to go through it, intersect through it, and people are crashing, getting in accidents and dying, and all this kind of stuff in this race. And he ends up coming in and, you know, having him you know, race for him, and, you know, Sid Haig is in this, is kind of like the top racer, and a real different kind of role for him for then, and he's kind of like the guy that everyone wants to beat, and the one guy is basically racing and kind of working on his car and planning things, and probably trying to win this race, that's essentially what it is, and then his stuff like relationship things that happen, but a pretty cool movie, I was actually more interested in this movie than I thought I was going to be, another one that has a really good transfer on this, this is the one that has the interview with Sid Haig talking about the making of this movie, it was a really good interview on here, uh, definitely check this out though, it's just a different, like if you're into those kind of movies like from the uh, 60s, this one I want to talk about, I'm, I, and I think that PBS listened, because when I talked about this, you know, the last release of this, I said I would love if it was all old ones, like some super old episodes, like from the 80s, you know, 86 and things like that. And I think like all of them except one were all from the 80s. This is Reading Rainbow. This is the one that has uh, Animal Cafe. I'll say PBS, keep putting these out and definitely keep putting a lot of the 80s ones because I absolutely obsess with these, especially the one on here which was the Animal Cafe one, was the one they feature with Lar Var Burton going to New York City at night. And he's showing people at night. It's like, like almost reminded me of like a pre-insomniac, pre-all those shows, just showing people making bread at night, what people are doing. And the thing that was amazing, one of the coolest things of bats I've ever seen in my entire life, and I'm not kidding, I've never seen anything so cool in my life. This guy showing this bat cave with this millions of bats everywhere, picking them up, talking about with his mask he's wearing, saying I was going to die if he's down there without the thing. It was amazing. I mean, that episode, I watched it twice, and I'm dead serious. I had to watch it two times. I love that episode so much. And these real 80s songs. Uh, I can't recommend this show enough. Like, there's not enough of this for kids anymore. Like, the things like this that teach kids, because to me, I'm going to be dead honest, this is some, to me, how I learned as a kid and even now you learn more way more stuff watching documentaries and things like that on subjects rather than you do in school that's totally my totally honest fear about the whole thing but you know school is still as important and everything but these kind of programs are really to me an important thing uh the next one from uh vinegar syndrome this is from their new line exploitation.tv i believe that's what it is and it's um a double feature with Crypt of the Living Dead and House of the Living Dead. And this one is about a guy going back to, because, you know, he goes to an island to bury his father, because his father ended up getting crushed by this tomb that he discovered. And, he, you know, he wants to open up the tomb, but they're all saying, don't do it. And, of course, he opens up the tomb that crushed his father, this, like, cat, this sarcophagus thing, and lets out this woman who's going around and killing the people there. And the other one is, like, a guy, and, you know, go, goes to this colony in South Africa, and he's like, these you know, people, he's going around killing people. Um, they have pretty good transfers on these. I didn't super get into these movies. I thought it was okay. It's not as, like, a lot of the Vinegar Syndrome releases are always kind of more extreme or out there movies. These are more kind of PG-ish a little bit. They're not bad or anything, but I didn't get into them as much as, like, some of their other stuff more out there and, like, kind of peculiar releases that I really like, like Sex World and that kind of stuff and Mad Men. It's, it's one of these ones that I feel like is a real forgotten movie, but I liked it, though, for the most part, but I just wasn't into them as much as I was other things of this of this period. This one, though, was actually pretty interesting. This is Night of the Strangler. Uh, I don't exactly know how to explain this movie, because I didn't even know half of what was going on half the time, but it's it's a pretty cool, weird movie, and the guy in it's from the Monkees, um, and he was pretty cool in this movie. And, like, it's basically, though, about... As far as I could tell, it was about this real racist kind of like landowner guy and his sister and 
she was getting married. She was getting married to this guy, and she wasn't happy about it because of you know ethnicity. And then he hires somebody to kill him. And then the monkeys guy is like talking to a priest. And then that it's like I can't tell what's happening in it. I was having a hell of a time figuring out exactly what's going on, but people are getting killed. And it's got these long drawn out sequences, and I was kind of wondering like, how did they get the monkeys guy to be in this? Because I don't know if this is right when the monkey started or what, but it was like really weird. It was like, I don't know, it's one of those things you really wonder, how did he get in this movie? Because it's so weird. And it's such a strange movie. And I always thought all the monkeys for some reason were British, but he's not. But this is a weird one. Just check this out. It's a very, very strange, impossible to explain movie though. Uh, the next one from Cynodyne from the Flatiron Films Company is Fight of the Living Dead. This has a whole bunch of YouTubers in this. I Justine, you know, Prank versus Prank. And I can't figure out exactly what this was meant to be, because I think it was supposed to be some kind of a pilot or some kind of a TV series or something. And I'm guessing they wanted to, like, take YouTubers and then put them into scripted situations. Like, I guess that's what they were going for. Because it's like these YouTubers that are, they wake up inside of a prison. It's like two teams of them, two different groups, trying to survive. And sorry, everybody, but if I was doing this, I would have done it a little bit more of, like, kind of, unscripted a bit more like you don't know exactly you know what's going to happen to them kind of more like um i don't know what i was thinking like kind of, i don't know it's very hard because like they get in this like prison they have to try and get out of there and there's zombies in there going after them it was kind of cool to see you know i just see in, in you know prank versus prank people acting the acting is a little bit off though because they're not really actors i just seen i know as an actress but not some of the other ones they're just sort of youtubers that are just I don't know if they're, that's their scene acting, you know what I mean? But it's okay. I mean, it's I, I for life of me can't figure out exactly what this was supposed to have been or what the exact attempt of this thing was exactly because it, it wasn't like it was real, you know what I mean? Um, the next one is from Wild Eye Releasing. This is one of my favorite Wild Eye Releasing titles that they've done next to... Um, what are some of the other ones that I really like? You know, Scream Park was one of my favorite ones. Um, Play Hooky. And this is a very different release from them, and this is actually going to be in Redbox, so it's pretty cool that they're getting this one to be in Redbox. This is called An American Bully, and this is not like a like a school shooting kind of movie, like you think or anything like that. It's about these kids at school, though, who are getting really picked on, and I thought the, the kids were great in this movie. The one teacher was really cool. Like I like all the characters in this movie, but there's like this bully that's bullying these kids because they're kind of into different stuff, and it's kind of about what happens when they try and stand up to this bully by posting this secret about him that they've kind of discovered and what he ends up doing. And it takes a real dark, really different kind of twisted turn. You know, Adrian King from Friday the 13th is in this movie. Um, I, th I thought it was a pretty good movie, very well acted. Definitely would recommend you guys check this out. And, you know, like I said, you guys can rent this in Redbox too coming up. Uh, the next one, this is a really, really, really cool movie. This is from Black Fawn Distribution, um, and this is called um, Silent Retreat. And this is another one I would highly recommend you guys watch. And this is about this kind of weird place where these girls are sent who have done kind of like, they get sent there for like doing bad things. Like the court sends them there, and there's only five of them there at that time. And, it's, it's, and they basically have these rules. It's like the father and these two, his two sons who run this place. And the rule is no one can talk in this place. And, you know, that's like no one can look at anybody. There's no eye contact. And it's got this weird undertone of, like, him trying to make the perfect, you know, I don't want to say exactly what he's doing because I don't want to ruin anything about it. But he's got these certain things he's trying to do to these girls. And it's definitely kind of... I, I loved it, though. Like, I especially love the two main actors in this movie. Definitely hope to see them in more stuff. And the main guy plays a pretty good, like, villain of these people. Because he's, like, brainwashing these girls. And they kind of wake up at times and don't remember what happened. But there's a whole other aspect to this movie of there's something out in the woods. Because the one girl that tries to leave them one night, and then they, they're going, Oh, get back in the car! You know, because when she tries to leave, because you see somebody traipsing around something in the woods. And you find there's something out in the woods. And... I, I don't know. This is a pretty cool movie with some different undertones to this. I really like this. Uh, the next one is from Wild Eye Releasings. This is the Zoe Kravitz movie. Um, you know, the one actor from this, too, is from Chappie. Um, really pretty cool movie. This is The Road Within. This is about a, um, this guy who ends up 
um, you know, being sent to a kind of a place where they try and treat people who have, you know, sort of mental disorders or like, you know, Tourette's or bulimia and all this kind of stuff. It's a facility where they're trying to treat them and kind of help get them under control a little bit. And it's about a group of them, you know, Zoe Kravitz's character who has a eating disorder, the one guy who is like a clean freak, washes his hands all the time, panicking if anyone touches him. The other guy has Tourette's and they end up taking the car out and going on like this road trip. And Robert Patrick plays the one kid's father and he's kind of coming after them with the doctor and trying to track them down and find out what they are. But they really want to get to the beach because the one's mother recently passed away and they before they got to go to the beach. Uh... I like this. I, I'm a huge fan lately of Zoe Kravitz. Uh, watched Dope a couple days ago. Amazing movie. Love that movie. Probably one of my favorite movies I've seen this year. Uh, definitely check this out, though. I, I, I like this a lot. Like I said, I'm a big fan of Zoe Kravitz. Uh, the next one is from um, MPI, you know, from IFC Midnight. And this is The Pact 2. This is okay. I really like The Pact 1 a lot. I mean, I really liked it. This is kind of like the killer from the first movie. Like, I, I, I had to watch the trailer again for The Pact, you know, because I had saw it in 2011, so I didn't remember it that well. But I remember, you know, really liking that. But the, the sequel, though, is the killer they believe, there's, you know, who they believe was dead in the first movie. Is, is like a, they believe it's a copycat killer going around. It's this woman who cleans up crime scenes, and her boyfriend is a cop. And she's starting to see these kind of visions and things of these murders, and, and she starts believing that, you know, she can see what before they happen, and the killer, killer's killing people around again, and says, is it, you know, what is it, is it a copycat, or is it a ghost, and things like that, she's kind of haunted by it, that's sort of what it is, some of the characters though, from the first movie come back around as well, it's just, I couldn't get into this one that much, because I really liked the first one, I just did not like this one as much, it just was not a up there par sequel, but anyway though guys, that's all for this DVD Blu-ray update, thanks again for watching, for subscribing guys, and I'll see you guys later.